Now, good afternoon to all of you and a very warm welcome to what is now already the third session in the ASEAN BCG Researcher Development Program. And as you know, this program is an initiative of Thailand's Program Management Unit for Human Resources and Institutional Development, or you may know it as PONUB. And it is organized by the International Cooperation Division of Thailand's National Science and Technology Development Agency, NASDA, with the support of Euraxis ASEAN. And of course, our NASDA colleagues are here today with us as well um, behind the scene. My name is Susanne Ransovaso. I'm regional coordinator for the Euraxis project here in Southeast Asia. We are a permission funded project, really all about bringing researchers together. And it is a fabulous, a really a great honor for us to support this project and for me personally also uh, to moderate the session uh, today. So some of you I'm sure have joined us last week when we focused on exploring tools and strategies for effective science communication. We had a, a full house as well. Today we are zooming in on um, something else, namely on the very novel um, idea of uh, research career development, namely design thinking. Now, before I introduce you to our, our speaker today, um, I want to just say a, a few words about this program. As I've said, it is a, uh, a two-phase program, and this is really a project for you, the researchers. It's all about upskilling yourself. Uh, providing you with the opportunity to become an even better researcher. The idea, of course, is always for you to also be able to collaborate with researchers uh, across ASEAN, but maybe also across um, the globe. Uh, this is a two-phase program, as uh, you know, I'm sure, because you're all registered. We have a series of seminars. Uh, virtual seminars that will run between February and May. And thereafter, in the second phase, NASDA will invite uh, 30 of you to actually come to visit them in Thailand for an on-site program where you will work with mentors to further strengthen your proposal writing and project leadership skills. Now, again, this is really a fabulous opportunity for you to upskill um, your skills as a researcher. And today we are zooming in on a really interesting uh, idea. It's design thinking, which is a process for creative problem solving that focuses on the solutions rather than the obstacles. So it's a fabulous tool for you to develop your own career path. And speaking with us today and to us today is Miss Nina and I have the honor also of introducing her to you. Now, in her own words, Nina is a communicator, a connector, and a change maker. But when you really when you look at her CV and what she's done, I would personally call her a powerhouse. She is looking back and forward, of course, at an almost 20-year career that has spanned leadership roles in the corporate the nonprofit, the creative enterprise, government, media, and the education sectors. And she is currently the founder and CEO of Imaginable Impact. She is really highly accomplished. She has launched companies in the Philippines, in the US, in Bahrain. She has spoken and conducted workshop across Southeast Asia, but also in the US. She is, and I find that personally very fascinating, she's a certified facilitator of the Lego Serious Play Method. I would really love to find out more about that, Nina. She is the creator of Mindful Manila and Girl Make Your Move, which empowers women to take action. And I think most importantly for us today, she's a highly experienced design thinking facilitator and practitioner. And she is joining us today to share with us her experience, how you can make use of this method for your own career development. Nina will speak to us now. And then of course, there is the opportunity for you really to 
get out all your questions and see how you can apply this particular method to your own career development. Nina, it's my pleasure to invite you to take the stage and to share your expertise with us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vasu. And you know, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I also want to thank and give a shout out to Dr. Jan Elmako, who first introduced me to the Euraxis community um, and has really been also uh, one of my partners and, and co-advocates in, in, you know, in all of these causes. So, and magandang hapon po to everyone from the Philippines. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I have a cross here. I'm Catholic and it's Ash Wednesday. So I had to perform my religious obligation. But, you know, it's, it's really a pleasure to see a diversity of countries, representations, fields, skill sets here. Um, I think that the topic we're going to be talking about, design thinking, is really meant for collaboration and experimentation and i think as researchers this is something that will truly resonate with you um, if you don't mind i will now launch into my slides so i will share my screen and you will see a canva deck i hope you're seeing this um, let me just make sure it's on full screen so um the thing though when i start presenting this i will not be able to see the chat um, so if uh, Dr. Suzanne doesn't mind, if there's something that's really urgent that needs to be said, we can um, call it out. But I'll also pause frequently just to check for questions. And I know there's a Q&A at the end. So again, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here um, and to speak with you all. Design thinking is a topic very close to my heart. But I'll begin, I'll start the this afternoon with a short confession and a short story. And I hope Nobody is scandalized by this, but the confession is that, uh, as uh, Dr. Vasu had mentioned, I'm a serial founder. I founded a number of startups, both as part of a day job, um, and but also as part of me being naturally entrepreneurial. I presently wear another hat. I have another hat doing investor relations for a startup reality TV show called The Final Pitch. So I talk to in, you know, investors and uh, bring them into the show to hear pitches of entrepreneurs. I'm also a mentor and a coach and I love teaching. If I could do that forever, I would um, actually. And I've been a university lecturer. But here's the thing, for some strange reason, I was able to land all of these roles without any formal training. And I know that, you know, I, I highly respect those of you with um, all of your degrees, I wish I had those, um, but I was grateful to have been given the opportunity to do all of these things without any of the further studies. So the question was, how did I get to that place, right? How on earth did I get here? Why did people give me the opportunity to, to do all these without, um, well, some, I had some certifications, of course, there was some expertise there, but, you know, how was I able to navigate these career, I guess, decisions and options um, in a very experimental way. And um, I will share with you a brief story and then we will talk about how design thinking was very instrumental to that. So if you will see here, this is kind of like my road to what I am now in the technology, both in the technology and kind of like in the impact and inclusion sectors. So my new company, um, imaginable impact is really about DEI or you know diversity and inclusion consulting. Um, but before this, you will see some keywords. I started out in telco, then I went to a nonprofit, and then I went, I launched my own editorial agency, an editorial business, publishing magazines and and all sorts of materials for different kinds of companies. Then I went into government and I became an advocate even inside government. Then I went into energy and then advertising and finally landed in innovation. Quite diverse, right? Um, but when I look at my entire career, and you might start thinking back into your own careers as well, start to think about the, the, the journey that led you to where you are today. I saw some common threads. So throughout this kind of weird path I was on, I was always, always, always an advocate um, throughout my entire, um, by now it's 24 years, so I've had a 24 year career. I've always had communications and advocacy as 
kind of like the backbone. Whether I was in the telco or in government or in energy or in any sphere, I was always acting as an advocate, like a brand ambassador, doing the communications, doing the marketing uh, and all that. Then another thread that I found was that through it all, I would always have, I guess what you would say, side hustles or passion projects. Oh, sorry, let me go back. I would always be on the side. I would always, always be writing. Even to this day, I write, um, I write articles for a website called The Independent Investor. But throughout the 24 years, I was always writing. I'd always formulate and conduct my own workshops just to share expertise you know, or insights or you know, inspire people and just do that as a hobby. Um, I would always also be teaching and mentoring. It was a calling that came naturally to me. And then you would see the, the dollar signs here. I realized also that at many points in my journey, I was always the person bringing in the money somehow. So when I was an entrepreneur, of course, I had to bring in money for myself. There was nobody else to do it for me. Um, and at certain stage, sometimes I was even fundraising for nonprofits. Um, even in government, when you're running a, a campaign and trying to get volunteers and donations, you're still bringing in money. Uh, again, when I uh, went into another business after my advertising stint, again, I had to bring in the money. I was very, very excited always about bringing in revenue. And today in, in my present role, it's definitely about bringing in the money, the investments. So I, I found that all throughout these different threads, the different sectors and industries, there were certain things that tied all of this together. Um, and this is something that helped me get to where I am to be. I'll, and I'll share a bit more about uh, a tool or a framework you can use to think about that in your own career. So my own career was really all about connecting the dots. Um, very diverse dots, as you can see, but somehow I was able to make sense out of that. And some insights I'll share with you that you can also apply to your own journey as we think about design thinking. I saw my entire career not as a ladder. It wasn't a very linear ladder where you go one step up, then another step up. As you can see here, it was just going in different directions, but somehow making sense out of it by connecting the dots and having an image and an understanding of that journey in my head. I always entered unfamiliar territory and I learned by doing. Another thing I realized about myself was that for some strange reason, companies would always hire me from the outside, put me in a leadership role, um, or create a new role or a new job for somebody like me. And then I had no predecessors, no guidebook. I just had to figure things out and make up the rules and make up the systems as I went along. And for some strange reason, that was a pattern that recurred throughout my career. And I was always thrust in leadership positions. Um, I was promoted only once in my career when I was very young. After being a management trainee, there was a natural promotion that came with that. But everywhere else, I did not rise up a ladder. I was plucked from the outside, recruited to be a leader in a new organization, and I would have to lead a team that I did not know previously. So I had to learn leadership and leading teams on the fly as well. It was just something that I had to learn how to do. Um, and it naturally led me to always ask, you know, why not do this? Or because I did not have the baggage, I suppose, um, or... I did not have a lot of yeah, baggage of having to do things a certain way because I was always coming in fresh. I was also always the person challenging, saying, you know, what if we do this? Why don't we try this? I know this is how things were done before, but what if? So I was always the person asking questions. Um, not everyone liked it or appreciated it, I think. Um, but I think it also served my curiosity, right? And that um, that search for innovative and resourceful um, solutions. So I'm just going to pause to check the chat just in case um, there's anything I need to, okay. So I think people are still greeting everyone. Um, I, I'm assuming there are no 
serious reminders for me. Okay. So Nothing I'm yet. I, I will let you know, Nina, if okay. there's anything. But so far. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. All right. So I shall proceed. Now, how does that apply to design thinking and how does that apply to your careers? You're actually very fortunate that we now live in a world where design thinking um, is very um, is, is promulgated uh, in, in a lot of places and that even as researchers, you're able to learn about this and see how this applies to your own um, career and your own life. And design thinking, also called human-centered design, it is really a framework. It's a framework, it's a way of looking at things, but it's also a process. There are steps that we go through um, to say that something has gone through human-centered design or design thinking. It's a problem-solving uh, method and process, as uh, Dr. Suzanne pointed out earlier. But to me, it's also been a way of life. Um, I can actually go on and on. We could have a really long conversation about how to use design thinking for your own life. But since we don't have so much time, we'll get right into it. Um, I will be sharing these slides, so um, but feel free to take uh, screenshots or notes. And I'll give you an overview. Then we'll go into some Q&A. And then you can read the rest in the slides. So design thinking really is a process and a framework that puts the human user at the heart of the process. So um, as Dr. Susan also mentioned earlier, it's not about you're not thinking about the problems or the obstacles, um, but you're really thinking about who is the person who will be most affected by this? Who is the person who will use this solution uh, a bit more and in the context of your design of, of your own research career this encourages you and challenges you to look at yourself the researcher the person whose career is being formed how does this serve you how does this solve your problems but also you always start with a place of empathy and understanding yourself or the human user in the middle of all of this but the very important thing also about design thinking, it's very iterative. So you keep on iterating, right? Or improving on things and you have to learn by doing. You're going to fail, but you have to fail fast. Um, and unfortunately, um, if you're a researcher, of course your tendency, will, you'll have to be very careful and you have to study a lot of things and um, you will need to take time design thinking challenges you to be a little bit more agile, um, you know, to be able to make decisions a bit more quickly, just to test things out, to be a bit more experimental. And then you learn. And then if you fail, then you know, you have some data and information, and then you pick yourself back up and, you know, try a different path. So let me just move here. Okay, so again, so it always starts with empathy, uh, and I'll explain that in a bit. And then it goes into something called definition, or you're defining the problem. Similar to research, you have to define a research problem, and you have to be very clear about your area of focus. And then ideation is always an exciting thing. You're brainstorming, you're thinking of new solutions. And then you prototype and you test. Um, and I know that in recent in research, you also do this to a certain extent, uh, but here it's the focus is really on learning as much as you can very early on and again, failing early and failing fast, and then moving on. And then you implement or launch your idea. So in empathy, I'm not going to read the whole paragraphs here, but I'll encourage you to look at the keywords on the left side. So empathy is really about understanding and feeling what the human user is feeling. So let's say this is really about your design, your research career. So empathy is really about you. How do you feel? You will have to observe yourself as you're making career decisions, right? You will have to listen to yourself, perhaps listen to other stakeholders. You will have to feel, really take the moment and the time to feel what it is that you're feeling and maybe understand the emotions a bit more about your research career and the things that you're experiencing as you're going through this career and to understand. So it's really, um, if, if the subject is you, then you really have to understand yourself a bit more. If the subject is somebody else, if you're doing a design thinking process 
for another group of users, you really need to understand that group of users really well. If you're designing um, a solution for uh, mothers of newborns um, in rural areas, you really have to understand and feel what a newborn, you know, a mother of a newborn in a rural area is feeling. But in this case, we will focus on you because this is about re, um, design thinking your research career. So that's very important. You cannot solve, you cannot create a solution or design a solution for someone you don't understand, right? We cannot design uh, an innovative pair of crutches, for example, or a, an innovative wheelchair if we don't know what it's like to lose the use of our legs. So it always comes from that place of empathy and understanding. And some empathy tools, um, I'm just really giving a brief overview, which would be familiar to you because you're in the research space. Um, there are some, what we call immersions or what we call deep dives. Um, it's really going into a specific um, area or a specific experience to understand how a user um, or you know, the subject behaves in that kind of a situation really to, to try to understand what their day is like, how do they make decisions, what are their motivations, right? Um, and if you're not able to do immersions or you're not able to do a deep dive because you don't have enough time, it's always good to do interviews. And I know that um, in the research field, you also do a lot of different kinds of interviews. In this case, in-depth one-on-one interviews would be great. Um, really try to understand the person you're solving um, the problem for. Um, um, and of course, in this case, because we're also talking about you as the subject, journaling would be a great tool to understand yourself better. So in the context of your research career, you might, start to you might want to start journaling you know, how you're feeling about your career, what are some of the highs and the lows? What are the things that motivate you, energize you, excite you? What are the things that frustrate you? Um, and there are many journaling tools and techniques, and you can explore that on your own. But I think that really understanding yourself as a research professional and your motivations and your highlights and your lowlights and your frustrations, that will also be key to design thinking your research career. Um, in, in certain cases, if you were to uh, design for somebody else, role playing would be important. It, it would be important to get yourself into the shoes of another person, right? To better understand them. So there are many different tools. Actually, what I can do is that um, after this talk, when I send over my slides, I can also send over a, um, a, an electronic booklet um, that is uh, made available by Stanford Design School. It's called the Design Thinking. I think bootleg boot camp. So they're giving us free access to some of these tools that you can also use in your own research career and in your in your own lives. So after you after you understand yourself, right, through some of these tools, you get a better understanding of the subject. Now you define the problem. But how do you do that? Um, Maybe Nina, yeah. there's there's one question on empathy. Maybe okay. uh, do you want to take that? It's just if you just let me read it out at yes, the please. end. Okay. Sorry, yes. it's, it's a question is from Thailand from mm -hmm. Mutai Chong Street, who says, um, sorry, it's from Musaimi Mustafa from Malaysia. Is right. role playing the same as an empathy map? Ah, okay, that's a really good question. So an empathy map is something that you use after. Um, so you can use a combination of these, immersions, interviews, journaling, role-playing, to get yourself into the shoes of the other person. Now, an empathy map is another, uh, well, tool or, or worksheet or template that you can use to map out the insights and the notes. It, it's actually a way to get, to organize the information. Because when you're doing all of these, when you're in an immersion, when you're in an interview, you're compiling a lot of notes, getting a lot of data. The empathy map will allow you to organize the data into, okay, what is, what is the user seeing and feeling? What are they hearing? So there are, there are different templates for empathy maps, but it's essentially um, an organization tool for the data and the insights that you have. But thank you for that question. OK. 
Okay, may just I be, be, before okay. we continue this, there's a little request. Maybe if you could speak a bit louder. Some uh, some colleagues have oh. problems hearing okay. you. So just just okay, but perfect. Otherwise, thank you so much, Nina. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I'm going to try. So I'm I'm wearing headphones. So maybe that means there's something wrong with my audio. But I'm going to do my best to speak louder. And I hope that um, yeah. If there's anything else, please let me know. Thank you so much. Okay. So. The next part is, so you've done the work of trying to understand yourself or your user through a lot of different tools. The hardest part of design thinking is actually asking the right question, is really defining the right problem that you're trying to solve. And this involves taking a look at all of the notes that you've compiled, all of the data you've gathered during the empathy process, to find patterns and distill insights. So in the context of your of your design thinking career, actually I'm going to jump into I'm going to jump into um a couple of slides here. Okay, here. So in the middle part, when when you're looking at defining the problem in the context of your career, look at your journey so far, look at your notes, um, your journaling, um, how you've been able to articulate how you feel about your career. Um, know what the real problem is when it, when it comes to your research career. Is it a capacity problem? For example, are you trying to do too many things? Do you have too many research interests and do you need to focus on something? Um, or maybe you have a growth problem, right? Are you stuck in a particular level? Do you want to advance in your career, but you're unable to? Or is there a growth problem in your organization? For example, you're not able to get a promotion. I mean, I'm just giving examples here. Um, and again, a culture fit problem. You might also be uh, in a job that you're in a career that you like doing, but maybe you're in the wrong organization. Right? Or it could be an economic problem. You love research, you love the topic, you love um, the trajectory you're on, but maybe the particular career doesn't, or the organization doesn't pay enough. So what does that, what does that mean in the context of your own career, right? Or do you have a location problem? Do you wish you were assigned somewhere else? Or do you wish you could work in a hybrid situation? Um, so important thing, in any, in any kind of design thinking problem is you have to get to the heart of the real problem. And when we talk about designing your own research career, you have to know what your problem is. It could be any of these. It could be a different problem altogether. Because if you don't ask the right question, every answer will be wrong, right? You can only get to the right answer if you ask the right question, if you're able to identify the right problem. And that's the case with any research problem, right? Any research challenge, you have to be able to ask the right questions. So I'll pause here and I'll go back to some slides. So that's what definition is about. It's really about looking at all the data that you have and see, okay, what's the key insight that's coming up here? Right? What are the questions that we really need to be asking? Um, in design thinking lingo, um, typically a design challenge is phrased as, how might we? So for example, uh, in my earlier example, how might we design a better, uh, how might we give um, disabled people or you know, uh, people with mobility issues, greater mobility without the clunkiness of a big wheelchair? In the context of your design of your research career, you might ask, "How might we, um, how might we pursue our passion, let's say, for this particular research topic, and be paid better?" Maybe that's your design challenge for yourself, right? Um, so, the next thing, oh, okay, and this is important. You also have to make sure you're asking an asking an actionable question and not what is called a gravity question. So a gravity question, according to the book Designing Your Life by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans of, the Stanford, of Stanford University, 
a gravity question is a question that you can never answer or that you will never be able to solve. For example, um, how might poets earn the same way as CEOs? You will never be able to answer that question because poets will never be like this world, the economy we're in, will never value poets in the same way as CEOs, right? So that's not even a gravity question. Or if you are, for example, I mean, for some of us, we might be asking, how might I marry the next um, Prince of Wales? Unless you're part of the royal family and you're British and all that, that is a gravity question. You will never be able to find a solution, right? So um, design thinking also challenges you to ask the right question and don't spend time on the questions you cannot ever answer. Right? So it's, it's really about framing the questions properly. Now, the exciting thing is that once you have the right question, you know you're solving for the right problem, then it's time to ideate. And ideation is about developing as many ideas as possible, as many solutions as possible without judging yourself first. It's really about quantity of ideas. This is the part where you brainstorm, you explore, you collaborate, you develop multiple paths. And you, you try to see, okay, what's going to happen if we do this? Um, and it's really just brainstorming. Nothing is being built or done yet. So you don't have to judge yourself. So it's important that at, this, at the ideation stage, you're not criticizing yourself. You're not editing out your ideas just yet. Accept any and all ideas. And you also collaborate with others to build on each other's ideas. And this would be the same um, when you're, when you're brainstorming on a research topic, for example, or you're brainstorming on solutions, it's always better when you have a colleague or a friend who's ideating with you. And this is also the time where it's okay to copy, borrow, steal. You're just, um, we're not saying plagiarism. We're saying take inspiration from other people's ideas. Just inspiration, but please do not ever infringe on anybody's copyright and you're just ideating anyway. Do not act on anything else at the moment. So this is the only time when it's okay to borrow another person's ideas. But once you get to execution, um, you definitely have to make sure to give credit where credit is due. So I hope I made that clear. Now, after you ideate, so ideation is that process where you really open yourself up to all sorts of ideas. You, there will come a time and you will have to give yourself a deadline when you need to choose already. You need to choose or shortlist several ideas and then maybe one to three ideas and then you prototype and you test. Now, prototyping is different from, um, it's, it's different from writing a plan or writing a paper. It's really about building something so that you can test your idea and learn it and build to fail early, right? So that you can also understand um, if this idea isn't working out. So if I may use a very basic example, prototyping is like going on a first date or maybe not even a date. It's like going for coffee, right? Having a meetup with a person you like just to see if there are sparks. So prototyping is the same. You have a small encounter with that solution, with that path. You have a small encounter with a person that you kind of like, or maybe you have scheduled three dates, right? Prototyping is like scheduling three coffee dates, and then you see which one sparks, which one has chemistry. Then if one person you met up with has no chemistry, then you know you kind of failed in that path, but you failed early then it's okay to move on before getting even more invested in a relationship. It's pretty much the same in design thinking. Well, so you, um, is there a question? All right. No, no question. Okay, so yeah, I tried to make the, the, the example as basic as possible. But here's something to also think about. When you're at the stage of prototyping a solution, if you've built something perfect, then you've, you've built it too late because a prototype is not meant to be perfect. 
it's meant to be the super scrappy, low fidelity version. If you see here, they're building a website actually, but they were building a website using paper, using placeholder. You know, they're trying to figure out what layout works best. You don't want to design something and use very expensive tools when prototyping. You can be very scrappy using very simple tools so that you also don't spend so much money and so much time. Okay, and I'll, I'll share some ideas on how you can actually prototype your own career. There's a quick question, Nina. There's a yes. question on this. It's uh, okay. from Malaysia, from Musaimi Mustafa, who says, yes. does that mean at ideation, we ought to preempt what we may face at prototyping? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a really good question. At ideation, you're not yet preempting anything. You're just generating ideas. Uh, and may, you, you may... I think you may preempt, but it's at prototyping, it's when you test your assumptions. So I would even suggest don't preempt anything. In ideation, you're really just throwing all the ideas out there. Good ideas, bad ideas. I mean, there's no such thing as a bad idea, actually. You build on the different ideas. Then when you get to the prototyping stage, you test your assumptions. So that's maybe where you have some preemptive questions and you ask yourself, okay, will this work if this, if I do this? So come up with certain assumptions, test those assumptions out, and then you'll find out the answer. But at the ideation stage, it's best that you don't do any kind of preemptive thinking. You're really meant to do this, this without any judgment, without any criticism, and without any blockers. So the more open you are, the more the ideas will flow. But Thank you so much. That's a good question. Okay, let me, let me, okay, let me go to this one. So um, we mentioned earlier that in the context of your research career, right? So at the empathy stage, you're checking in with yourself. You're trying to understand how you feel. What are your pain points? Again, your highlights, your lowlights. And I highlighted here. Where are you most in a where and when are you most in a state of flow? You know, when is that moment or what do you love doing that it's like time stops and you can do this forever? You forget your hunger, you forget time. It's like you're really zoning in on something. That's the moment when you're in a state of flow. And you take note of that because that's going to be very important in deciding you know, the future of your career as well. You want to have more of those flow moments and less of the friction moments. But you also have to understand what are your needs, right? The needs of a young person starting a research career in their 20s would be different from a person um, who's like myself, you know, in their mid-40s, sending kids to school, maybe taking care of a, an ill parent, having all of these goals, your financial needs will be different in the context of your career. So you also have to take note of that. And then once you know that, as mentioned earlier, when you go into the definition portion, you have to also understand what's the real problem you're trying to solve in your own career, right? And then in ideation, and here's maybe where, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Mustafa's question can also come into um, play in the ideations um, part of your mapping out and um, design thinking your own research career. Try to map out your parallel career tracks. Let's say if I were to continue on this current career track I'm on, what would be what would happen? What would my life be like, or what would the next steps be like? But what if I could have two more alternate career paths? What if I took uh, on further studies and a scholarship in this field, where would that career lead me? Or, but what if I became an entrepreneur and decide to become you know, an applied researcher and do something in the context of an enterprise or a venture? What would that look like? So map out the different career tracks, kind of like, you know, you're really just, this is really just imagination and fantasy, right? So, it, and maybe this is where you're kind of preempting things because you're mapping out what will happen next and then what will happen next. But in the prototyping stage, this is where you take very tangible baby steps. So let's say you have your three career paths that you're ideating on. 
in prototyping, you take very small steps to try to explore each of those paths. So you might want to set up an in informational interview with somebody who is already doing what you want to do or who has shifted careers into the path you want to take. Or you might even want to set up an inter informational interview with a person who's recruiting for a company you want to join. And some companies are actually open to such informational interviews. It doesn't mean you're interviewing for the job. It just means you're interviewing to learn more about the company. You can also pilot a small side project. Um, so uh, I will give a very concrete example. Um, for my, my own journey into inclusion and diversity consulting was also inspired by a project that Dr. Jenny Almaco and I ran in 2021 to last year. We ran a girls congress and that was really a small side project um, to try to see, you know, what impact could we create if we had uh, a women empowerment program for girls, right? And the realization was it's not just schools that need it, companies need it, you know, other groups need it. So that small project gave us more information and insights that led me to other career choices. Um, and I know that as researchers, you probably have your hands full already, but some of you might actually want to volunteer or intern or even mentor for a company that you want to explore. Just take baby steps to get yourself closer. And again, if you have different paths, you try to take small steps in each of them, each of those paths, then see what makes sense for you. And you really have to use this time to also test out how do you feel and what do you think about this, both mind and body, and you no, know, mind, heart, you know, body. Check in with your gut check in with your your you know your cerebral mind check in with your emotions and how you're feeling about things right and get feedback from people close to you you know what do you think if i pursued this path um get feedback from former bosses and mentors or you know people who know you very much before you make your move and boldly take the next step the thing is though design thinking is always iterative so you will always need to be uh, aware of feedback and know that you will always be improving the the this stage is never the final stage it's only the beginning of more steps that you will take because as i mentioned let me just go back and i know that um there might be other questions here so i'm just going to go back to a couple of slides so the important thing to remember about design thinking is that it is always, always iterative. You will always be going through the cycle. Yeah, there are a lot of questions now, Nina. I don't know All whether right. you want to do, uh, yes, actually. perhaps take them here before we move on. So there was a question, first of all, mm -hmm. from uh, the Philippines. Joe Beat was asking, can you give further examples on the state of flow? Ah, okay. Let me just go back to that point as well. So. Uh, and, you know, there's a great TED talk by, I can't pronounce his surname, but Mihaili something, I, I'll send that, but there's a great TED talk on um, the state of flow and how it could be the key to, to happiness. So as being in a state of flow means two things. You are in a state where your brain is being challenged. It's, it's a little bit difficult that you can't just give up you know, you can't just give up and, and, um, and solve something so easily, but it's also super fulfilling. You can't stop. So um, in the kinds of workshops I conduct, um, Lego serious play, being in a state, like actually playing and solving questions and solving, solving problems with your hands using Legos puts you in a state of flow because it's challenging. It's challenging your brain. The answer isn't straightforward, but it's fun. It makes you keep, you know, keep going. So it, some gamers experience this when you are, when they say you're in the zone, right? When nothing else matters, but this thing that you're doing. Um, some gamers experience that when they're lost in a game, they're really trying to get to the next level. They forget to eat, they lose track of time. They're in a state of flow. 
um, it's the same for me when I'm preparing a deck or when I'm in a talk. And again, I forget hunger, time, etc. When you're really enjoying what you're doing, but it's also challenging. Um, it's it's not too easy. It's a bit difficult and it's challenging that it's pushing your brain to try a bit harder. But it's actually a pleasurable kind of challenge. That's when you're in a state of flow. Um, and again, uh, I can send the the TED talk that talks most about that. Um, so that you can explore the topic further. But you're in a state of flow when it's challenging, but it's fun and you can't stop and it keeps you up at night and you just want to keep going. So that's how you know you're there. I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, and you know, we can actually, um, the rest of this um, are just some pointers. So we can actually go into questions and um, I can share this deck. The, the only last thing I'll, I'll actually say um, I'll share something. Um, there are some thought starters, but I will encourage our audience to take a look at these three books that have pre been pretty life-changing for me. And if you want to dive deeper into design thinking, but also um, finding more meaning and purpose in your own career, I would encourage these books, Designing Your Life, so How to Build a Well-Lived, Joyful Life, um, of course, which talks about designing your life in general then the same authors wrote designing your work life and they say don't resign but reframe so reframe your work challenges and see how you can turn them into actionable solutions right and then ikigai so there's this diagram called the ikigai diagram i'm not sure if you're familiar with it but i would leave this here i would encourage you to look it up read up on it um, try to do this for yourself. Really figure out what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for, and what the world needs. And then somehow you'll be able to find you know, that sweet spot for your own career. So there are many other thought starters in this deck, but I'll, um, I'll share this with you separately and then we can take questions now, actually. Thank you so much, Nina. I think our NASDAQ colleagues would like us to just first of all, share some questions for the audience to answer and then we will have time to do sure. the q &A. yes yeah. actually. so we I have, the, have some good questions the, there are some questions here so if everybody uh, uh, if you can see there's a poll here it would be great for you to just answer these three quick questions and then we can spend our remaining minutes with the many, many questions that have come in in the chat box. So if you could just answer the three questions. What is your meaningful experience of doing, failing, and improving? You could give a short answer there. Have you entered unfamiliar territory? What was the result of that? And perhaps finally, is there a book that you could recommend to your colleagues? So the answers are coming in now. So you have, let's say we, we everybody has three minutes and then Nina, we can look at some of these great questions. So people are really excited. Um, and actually, I think while people are typing, I'm going to go to the questions. So yeah, great question. So let us see. Exactly. So let's see. We, we don't have to do them in the order, but let's see what where we should start. Here is a good question. I think someone was asking from Malaysia and he or she was asking whether you can actually spend too much time in, let's see, where it is. Sorry, there are so many questions I actually have to. I know, I saw, Google. I saw that earlier as well. Um. Maybe we uh, ask this question first, it's from Ayu from Indonesia. Okay. Is, is there a definite timeline in conducting this process? Hmm, not, that's a really good question. Um, the answer is, it's really up to you. You know, there are some, so I've done this also in the context of some companies. 
some companies will do this for will will do the process for a few days. Some companies will do this for weeks or months. I would suggest you give yourself your own timeline because this is about your own career, right? So give yourself a timeline and then map out the different phases. It's harder when you're doing it for yourself, but at the very least, doing this process will take at the very least a couple of weeks. You can't rush this, especially because of the date, internal data gathering you have to do on yourself, right? Um, that is quite difficult work. Thank you, Nina. There's a question from Thailand from Ismat Karim, who is wondering, before going to launch, how do we analyze the feasibility of our design project? No, that's, that's a really good question. So that's where the prototyping and testing comes in. So when you're designing your own research career, the only person you're prototyping and testing on is yourself. But when you're, launch, when you're design thinking a larger project, you really need to have, number one, you really need to have stakeholders or sample stakeholders um, prototype and test. I mean, test your prototype to get their feedback. So in the technology world, um, you know, there's such a thing as user testing um, could be the same in the research world. So test it on um, a set or a sample of potential users or you know, your target. Uh, it's also important to do internal tests and you have to have criteria so you have to check is this feasible within the time frame is this within budget you have to have all sorts of criteria internally to make sure that's that something is actually feasible and then you also need to do some external research you know what have other people said about similar methods so um the prototyping and testing part can also actually take time. And that's something that you need to do carefully, especially if you're doing a big project that's meant to be used for the public. Thank you, Nina. And this is the question from Malaysia from Kenneth. Kenneth Fum is asking, how can we restrain ourselves from ideating too wildly and saying yes to everything? Oh, no, that's a great question. Okay, so here's the thing. When you're at the ideating stage, don't restrain yourself, like go crazy, right? But give yourself a time limit. Um, I mean, for example, in, in an actual workshop, I would probably give um, my participants only five minutes to ideate. But let's say you're doing this in the context of your own career, maybe give yourself a couple of days, you know, have a timeline. And then you shouldn't say yes to everything. That's why prototyping and testing is important. You have to come up with your own criteria about which of these hundreds of wild ideas, which would make it to my top five, for example. So you have an initial set of criteria, right? And then of the top five, you prototype and you test and you say, okay, what will be my final criteria? So you have to have that discipline as well um, to be able to do this. Thank you. There's many questions here as well. Everybody finds it really exciting, Nina. And also to reassure everyone, you will receive a copy of Nina's deck of slides and also a recording of today's session. And Nidia from Indonesia, she says this is extremely interesting, but it's complicated. And you, I guess everybody has to spend some time to see how it applies to their own career development. But, but Nidia has a question or a comment. She says, even though we ask the right questions, how do we know that we've answered them truthfully? Oh. How do we know that it wasn't just our biases Ooh. talking? <laughs> I, I saw that question and I was like, wow, she, I mean, I'm assuming um, it's a female, but you're speaking to me. Though Those are my questions too. So um, number one, it's important to be aware of your biases, right? So once you're aware that this might be coming from a place of bias, then it's also important to maybe seek the counsel or uh, get feedback from people very close to you. Um, so it's, it's important to get to know your own voice, know which ones are coming from a place of bias, but also look at your career history, right? Um, and see where are the, what, what times or in which areas did I succeed the most in? Uh, try to get as empirical as possible data on your own career history. What times was I really successful? What were the conditions that led to the success, right? What 
what times did I fail really badly and what were the conditions around that failure? And then you try to see, okay, do I have the conditions for success at this time? So you try to apply some research discipline as well um, into your own decision-making so that you are acting less from a place of bias and less from a place of fear and more from a place of logic and you know, insightful patterns and all that. I hope that helped, but that was a really great question. Thank you, Nina. Yes, uh, uh, maybe a couple more questions. And I think this is a good, there's a lot of questions always related to how do you motivate yourself if you're facing uh, obstacles or snags within the process. But someone is asking from Malaysia, Noor Aslin Ghazali is asking, is it good to be in the state of flow too much? Mm, no, that's also a really good question. Here's the thing about flow, right? When you're in that state, it can seem endless. But that's why it's important what you said. Let, you know, we have the rest of life. We have obligations. So I feel like you cannot always be in a state of flow and forget everything else. Because when you're, when you're in a state of flow, you can just go on and on and on forever. But you also have to remember that this is also about living a well-balanced, responsible life. So even if you love something and you're always in a state of flow, you also have to ask yourself, is this thing that you love doing, is it paying the bills? Is it allowing you to take care of your health? Maybe you're doing things too much, you forget to take a bath and eat and all that, right? So is it allowing you to cultivate healthy relationships? So you always have to still look at things in the context of your life and how should a responsible person live and then you and then you'll see then um maybe there are times when you'll have to do things that are not flow activities but you just have to do them so you, it, it's really a matter of balancing things out thank you so much i think that was a really good answer now we have uh, one more question here it's a very concrete one is from thailand from jao varit uh, jantaka who asks uh, whether you have any examples for cultural fit problems, the way oh. you would define it, yeah. Yes, uh, that um, I saw that question too. So I will give you a very concrete example from my own experience. Um, this is not going to be shared outside of this group anyway. So I, uh, I recently was um, part of a job that I loved. So I was in there for three and a half years. I was doing the things I really loved. I was almost always in a state of flow. I would work 18 hours for you know days on end. It was just a place where I felt I, um, I was doing things that I liked. Um, I was uh, doing things that were meaningful to me. The role was, you know, the pay was good, so everything. But the culture fit problem happened when I realized that that job was causing me to do things that were against my values and my principles and it was starting to become a really toxic workplace so culture fit um culture is different for many you know different people but for me it was always very important that i had to be in a job where my integrity could be intact where i had no moral dilemmas and ethical issues because I cannot accept, I'm not a person who can compartmentalize. Some people will say, you know, just do the job. It's just a job anyway. That's not the case for me. I have to be in a job I absolutely believe in. So when the job started becoming or presenting certain moral, ethical, integrity issues, then I knew it was no longer the place for me, even if I love the work, even if I love the people. Um, and that that's an example of cultural fit. Sometimes you're in the right role, but the organization just has a lot of friction. You know, again, I'll go back to a dating analogy. Sorry, it's because it's just super easy to do a dating analogy. It's like being with the person that everyone says you should be with. Like, this is the perfect person. But when you actually start going out with that person, you realize, but that person is not right for me. Right? Or it's like, uh, I'm... Uh, I'm going to go into stereotypes, but you know, I love clothes. So it's like seeing the perfect dress on that window shop. This is the perfect dress. But when you try it on for yourself, oh, doesn't look good on me. Doesn't make me feel good, right? Or driving a car. It could look like the perfect car when you actually get in 
doesn't feel right. So it's really an emotion. You you feel it, you sense it, um, and it's only you who can define what's a culture fit and what's not. Thank you I so love, much, Nina. I love the questions. Um, you know, the, I know fantastic question. I think we have the the perfect final question. This is from Malaysia because we just reached the end, and I know you're all interested in the outcome also of the poll. I guess specifically the last question. Uh, I'm sure the Nasdaq colleagues will will share whatever they can with the participants as well. But I think this question concludes it all. It's from Si Yan Li in Malaysia, and she is asking. How do we know if we have actually actually succeeded in applying design thinking skills in our research career? Oh, wow. That, yeah, that's a great question. So I will go back and um, you'll, you'll have the slides anyway. I will go back to um, a couple of points. Number one, design thinking is always about putting the human at the heart of the process. So if you are solving problems with a human at the center of it you're not falling in love with any ideas too much you're really trying to solve the problem like in your case are you really understanding yourself are you really solving your core issues right then you're applying design thinking number two design thinking is iterative it's an ongoing process are you always understanding yourself, getting feedback, and trying to improve things and making things better each time, you know, in an experimental way, but also in a way that's always adding value each time you improve the, the process or the outcome, then that's design thinking. So design thinking is always iterative. It's always human-centered. Um, and you fear failure less each time you, you know you become braver and more courageous each time there's another book i will encourage you to read it's called creative confidence by david kelly david kelly was one of the founders of stanford design school and he's also the founder of a global innovation firm called ideo it's a fantastic book i will encourage you to read it and also give it as gifts to people and all that it's it's just it changed my life so it will i'm sure it will inspire some of you as well thank you so much nina now we've had a lot of questions and i've picked questions from across asean thailand indonesia uh malaysia and vietnam so we had a good spread of course there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered because unfortunately we don't have more time but perhaps i'm sure nina will indulge you if you get in touch with her first of yeah. all of course as she said, she'll share her slides with you. And I think it was a fantastic, very clear presentation. But as you said, this is all human centered. So, you know, we now as your listeners have to apply this to our own stories yep. and, and look at this very self critically and, and with an open heart and with an yes. open mind. But I'm yes. sure if you have any urgent questions, then Nina will be more than happy to just also give you some um, some advice, maybe yes. on an, an email sure. basis. Feel free to um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you'll just see me, Nina Terol. Um, and yes, I will send the slides and um, the Stanford Design um, School bootleg, bootcamp bootleg, as well as a link to Creative Confidence and the TED Talk on Flow. So I owe you four things. I will send it to Dr. Suzanne so that the team can send it to, over to everybody. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we will all have access to this material, which is very dense, but incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much, Nina. I've listened to this before, and it's been really helpful. And I'm sure it will be really helpful to everybody who was here today, and they can apply it to their own research careers and, you know, move in new directions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you and so much, everybody. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you all again in just uh, a few days' time on the 1st of March. If you allow me, I quickly share my screen and I'll show you the next session on the 1st of March. Um, again, competency skills managing your research career. We will have two other very fabulous speakers Dr. Kamadasan Kalidasan from Singapore, and he is joined by Dr. Jojo Ju Lord Nem Singh, who is based in uh, the Netherlands, but he's from the Philippines. He's an ERC grantee. And these two will continue this fabulous series to provide you with skills to further enhance your 
and the designing of your fabulous research careers. So thank you so much, Nina. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful to see you all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. From the Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.